The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents How to Deal with Intractable Minds. And you don't have to pretend like you're not here, by the way, because everybody's going to know it was here. <laughs> Uh, so if I say something funny, laugh, or is it really going to be goofy on there? I have a t-shirt that I put out. Somebody just had me sign one that says, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Now, this has been a statement that some people thought, oh my gosh, that's just so profound. And others were like, eh, that's pedestrian. He's cribbing Hume. And they're right. Uh, <laughs> but somebody made a comment, uh, somebody made a meme out of it, and another atheist speaker said, oh, why on earth would we waste time on that? Let's find something important, Matt has said, and put that out as a meme instead. And I wanted to start by talking about why that's actually important. <laughs> Believing as many true things and as few false things as possible, you have to have both components. If you want to just believe as many true things as possible, you would believe everything. And if you want to believe as few false things as possible, you would believe nothing. You have to have both components. That's, that's the power of it. But his point was, hey, doesn't everybody want to believe as many true things and as few as false as possible? No. No, they don't. I'm sorry that you haven't met enough people, but I've, <laughs> I've had people call into the show and flatly tell me that they don't care whether or not their beliefs are true. There are people who you can have conversations with who will tell you they care more about whether the belief is comforting or if it feels good or feels real to them than whether or not it's true. But don't most people say that they care about truth? Yeah, they probably do. But most people say all kinds of stuff which might not match to what they actually do. In a world of alternative facts where people are being spoon-fed stories online that just reaffirm views that they already hold, it's clear that a sincere dedication to truth isn't as important to some people as comfort. And we have problems. We talked a little bit about some of these earlier where you're being your feed on Facebook and other places, your social media is a reinforcing feed, not so much a truth feed. It's faithy in a way in that there's no guarantee that this online feed of information is likely to get you anywhere near the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. Almost all those people probably think they have the truth, but they haven't taken the steps to find out whether or not it is true. And some of them don't even know what steps to take. We don't have the time to become an expert on everything. Where, how do you figure out who to listen to? I have arguments with people all the time where this side will send me study after study after study, and the opposite side will send me study after study after study. And I'm not an expert in this, so which studies do I listen to? Which studies do I pay attention to? Ah, is it just peer-reviewed? What if there's peer-reviewed stuff going both ways? Or what if you've got problems with peer-reviewed journals? Oh, well, I don't have the ability to analyze the data. So how do you make up your mind? And people give up because it's easier to just go with what you feel. Because it's hard work to take an inventory of your life. It's hard work to take an inventory of everything you've been presented with. And we don't always do this. There, it's not that people are comfortable being wrong because they probably think they're right. They're uncomfortable being exposed as being wrong. And being exposed is something that all of us try desperately to avoid. Atheists, humanists, free thinkers, skeptics, secularists, we haven't cornered the market on reason, we haven't cornered the market on virtue, and we haven't cornered the market on getting out from underneath our biases and our fears. Are we better at it than others? Sure. There may be people who are better at it than we are. If you pick an unfalsifiable belief, and by unfalsifiable, I mean a belief which cannot be shown to be false, something that is immune to disconfirmation. Now you're safe. Nobody can ever prove you wrong. My God's real. He exists outside of space and time. What the hell does that mean? Ex exists outside of space. What makes you think there is or could be anything other than space and time? What does it mean to exist absent time? If you remove time from it, there's no existence. If you exist for zero seconds, you don't exist. How does this make any sense? Ah, it's a different thing. It's in a different category and you can't possibly prove it wrong. And therefore, I never have to worry about being exposed as being wrong. Now, their position may in fact be faith-based, 
I would argue that it almost certainly is. Uh, I just got a message from my wife. She's at an ice cream festival. <laughs> Which, by the way, is probably a good outing. Maybe not so much for me, but for other people. But if you have a faith-based position, or if the person you're talking to has, to have a, has a faith-based position, you actually have to demonstrate this. You either need to get them to acknowledge that their position is based on faith and come to an understanding of what that means. Because for me, faith is the excuse people give when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, you don't ever say it's faith-based. You give the reason. And so exposing this and getting them to acknowledge it is the first step. Because if you just say, ah, your position is faith-based, and they don't understand that, and they think it's not, you've made no progress. And I've talked a lot about how to change minds. And at most of these events, somebody will come up to me and it'd be like, oh, it's so great to meet you. I've been watching your show for 10 years. You are the reason I'm an atheist. You changed my mind. And my answer is always the same. No, I didn't. You changed your mind. There were a thousand other people that heard me say the exact same thing you heard, probably more than a thousand now, but uh, hundred, a million people heard me say. <laughs> The same thing that you heard, and a good chunk of them didn't change their mind, which means you had to be willing to listen, reevaluate, and go where the evidence leads instead of leading where you wanted, or leading the evidence towards your conclusion. So take credit for that, or responsibility, as the case may be. I can easily deal with people who want to discuss arguments and evidence. I can easily deal with people if we can get to agree on a foundation for what's how we would go about determining what's real, what's true. As long as we're in agreement that we're gonna go about it through evidence and argument, cool. Now we can talk about the teleological argument, the cosmological argument, the moral arguments, all these things, that's easy. But what about those people who don't have that foundation? What about those people who don't care about any argument you could ever present? Seth talking to his mom, there's nothing you can say that would ever change my mind. I've heard that from family members. I've heard that from friends. Nothing you could say that could ever change my mind. Even Ray Comfort, who was here the last time I was here, acknowledges that nothing could change his mind about Jesus because he's as real to Ray as Ray's wife, which I think we already acknowledged is incredibly hyperbolic and bullshit. <laughs> but I have relatives and friends whose belief is based on a personal relationship. Uh, they don't think that's faith. Uh, there's a layer between their faith of raw experience. Now, I can't prove that those experiences they had aren't real. They're, they're unfalsifiable. Jesus is real in my life. I, I know what Jesus has done for me. Okay, cool. Tell me something that Jesus has done for you. Well, he helped me find my car keys at one time. Uh, yes, I picked a silly example, not to mock, but to make it obvious. Ah. Let's assume for a second that Jesus did, in fact, help you find your car keys. How do you know that it was Jesus who helped you find your car keys? Oh, because I said a prayer. I prayed, and then I found my car keys. Okay. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this, that's the fallacy. Don't do that. Don't do what I just did. I've talked about this before. The people you're talking to, they probably don't have a good understanding of logical fallacies or why they're important. They don't have a good understanding of logical arguments. So if you just name the fallacy, all you're doing is showing how much smarter you are than they are. You haven't actually taught them anything. Uh, we have my wife to credit for this because I came home from the show after identifying an argument from ignorance fallacy and uh, I was uh, not literally but figuratively bonked over the head and told stop doing that. Because for people who don't know what an argument from ignorance fallacy is, you just called them stupid. In the colloquial sense, if you say, oh, that's an argument from ignorance fallacy, ignorance equals stupidity, now you're just mocking me, they don't have the foundation. You have to build up to that foundation. How do we know it was Jesus who did anything? Oh, help me find my car keys. This is dismissed as absurd to question. If my mom's convinced, or my brother-in-law is convinced, or somebody I know is convinced that Jesus did something for them, asking, how do you know that? That question makes no sense to them. They just know. It's not like she sat down and thought, hmm, was it really Jesus or was it luck? Or was it coincidence? Was it no? No, she just knows. How 
if they're in this position where there's nothing that you can say or seemingly nothing you can say that can change their mind or they state that you can't change their mind, how do you deal with that? Do you point out problems in the Bible? We can point out problems in the Bible all day long. I have relatives who fully acknowledge they've never read the Old Testament. They don't care about what's a problem in the Bible that some atheist pointed out um, because they've already been taught, essentially. Of course there's errors in the Bible, scribal errors, unimportant things. These things have been passed down. There were oral traditions that were written down. Some of the stuff's going to be a little bit wrong, but the essential stuff is right. And you might think, yes, but I can follow that up with, if the essential stuff is right, then how did we get over a thousand denominations that all identify as Christian? If the essential stuff is right, how can there be so much disagreement? Well, there's an answer for that too. Those other people are false Christians. I have the truth. There's a defense mechanism that spirals down to cover all of these. They just believe it, or more accurately, more accurately, they just believe what they think it says, what they interpret as it's saying. If you, I have a number of verses that I can quote off the top of my head. Not nearly as many as I used to be able to quote because it doesn't matter. <laughs> but there's a couple that are convenient. First Peter 3.15 is probably the one I've quoted the most. Exodus uh, 21 about slavery, etc. The funny thing is my believing family members who won't change their mind, who don't care about logical arguments, they got verses they can quote too. Conveniently, those verses all support what they believe or what they think they believe, and their interpretation of it supports it. I watched, I talked about it once before, and I'll, I'll keep this brief. My favorite debate of all time was actually between Matt Slick and Jesse Morrell. Two Christians, one's a Calvinist, one's not, arguing about what the Bible says about how to be saved. And my favorite thing of it was one of them would go Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse that supported their position. And I agreed with them that those verses supported the position they were advocating. And then the other guy would go, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. And I agreed with him that all of those verses supported his position. The funny thing is, they didn't use the same verses, and they didn't ever point out why the other guy's verses were being interpreted incorrectly. It might have well have been two separate speeches. Here's what I think about the Bible, and here's my verses. Here's what I think about the Bible, and here's my verse. There was no real debate there. But if the primary foundation upon which they're going to believe is personal experience, how do you diffuse that? How do you engage with that? Somebody comes up and tells me they were abducted by aliens. I'm not going to believe that that's what happened. I'm willing to accept that they had some experience and that they are perhaps honestly doing their best to relay their understanding of that experience. But they, the truth is they had an experience and they reached conclusions about it. And I want to know why. What's the justification for your conclusions? And there are people who aren't interested in that. It's just obvious. It's just real. They go to church. They sing. They feel this stuff. Oh, it doesn't matter if there's a bunch of other religions where they might have felt the same way. It doesn't matter if secular music can make them feel the same way. It's not quite the same because here I know it's the Holy Spirit. And I know it's the Holy Spirit because everybody around me says it's the Holy Spirit. And we're all in agreement and we're right. How do you change those minds? Now, to be sure, I, I think this is a minority portion of theistic community. I think a lot of people who haven't given it much thought, I think that when you push people to acknowledge that they use reason in science and other areas of their life, that a good chunk of them are reachable. I, last time I was here, I talked about going after fundamentalists because of their rigid structure. Um, I don't think they're the only people that you can go after, but the interesting thing about more liberal and moderate theologies is that they've already dealt with the hard issues that you're going to present. They've already dealt with the knockdown things, and they've found a fungible, malleable belief that allows them to just shrug all that off. How do you change minds when somebody seems impervious to reason, evidence, logic, doesn't care whether they're being fallacious, they just know what they feel and it's true and you're going to hell for disagreeing. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have an answer. I don't know who the foremost expert is on changing religious people's minds, uh, but any list of people with a demonstrated expertise would almost certainly include me and I don't know. I don't know how to break through the seemingly impervious wall. And I say seemingly 
because we know that there are people who were in that position who found their way out. And they found their way out for different reasons. There's not a single bullet, a silver bullet. But here's what we do know. Before the last conference, um, somebody told me that they preferred the old me. The relentless ranting firebrand that was attacking religion and you know, yelling at people and hanging up on them. <laughs> That's still me. It's just not all of me. And by the way, it wasn't all of me then anyway. If you were watching just clips of the show, you got the selected highlight clips. I think if you even go back to within the first year, you'll find me spending 40 minutes carefully, reasonably trying to talk to someone before I hung up on him and called him an idiot. <laughs> I think I rant less than I used to, which I think adds value to the rants. Uh, anybody familiar with Penn and Teller? Uh, Teller can talk. He just doesn't. Which means if you're at a dinner table with 10 people and Teller opens his mouth and starts talking, everybody shuts up. <laughs> Even people have known him for years because there's this, oh, this is different. If all you do is rant, it takes the impact out of the ranting. But there's, oh, well, Matt, you've just gotten softer. You're, you're, just, you're just getting old, mellow. Uh, I'd like to think that it's based on experience of finding out what works and what doesn't. I think the person who liked the old me has a partially fictional memory uh, of who I used to be based on the highlights. And uh, I like to avoid bad arguments. I like to avoid hyperbole. I try to honestly address my opponent's positions fairly. I will still call out the Catholic Church as a criminal organization, along with non-Catholics who are protecting child rapists at the drop of a hat. I got no problem with that at all. But I also like to think that I'm a little better at this than I was 13, 14 years ago, and it would be pretty sad if that's not the case. But I have a few tips they're not guarantees on how to change intractable minds or change any mind, but they're a few tips that I've learned over the years. You don't have to use all of them, you don't have to use any of them, but you should or you're wrong. <laughs> it's just, just the way it is. Number one, listen charitably. Everybody's got a family member who's batshit crazy. Everybody does. And oh my gosh, is it frustrating to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But if you're one of the people who've changed your minds on a significant issue, maybe you changed your minds about gods or religions or whatever, try to remember that you probably would have been in that category to somebody else, and you probably are in that category to somebody else right now. So when somebody says something, instead of beginning by assuming that they're an evil person saying the worst and they're, they're deluded and everything else, start by trying to find a way where you could imagine this could feel reasonable even if it's not. Instead of assuming motivations, don't pretend that you can read people's minds. Leave that to those of us who fake it professionally. Instead of assuming you can read people's minds, talk to them and get clarification. Number two, have the right reasons for engaging why are you having this conversation in the first place? We talked earlier about whether or not to engage the street preacher out there, and we were largely in agreement that you, know, you need some kind of audience most of the time for it to be useful. Uh, I talked to a street preacher in Australia who, uh, whew, it was a mess, and he ended up asking me, because we were talking about magic as well, he asked me if the guys on TV doing magic were using real magic or just tricks. <laughs> now, this is foundational to his other confusions, his other irrational positions. And so he asked, he's like, he asked about people levitating, and I said, stay right there. And I walked a couple feet away, and it levitated right there on the street. And I turned around, and he was like, oh. And I was like, wait. And then I did it again, where he could see how I did it. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> Stop. You shouldn't feel sad, because the only thing that changed is you had an incorrect understanding of reality, and it has now been corrected. What's making you sad is that you really hoped that there was real magic, and this just chipped away at the idea that there's any real magic. But what are your reasons for engaging? Is it to show how smart you are, to show how right you are? Is it to mock or belittle people? 
Um, atheists get accused of being smug and angry and arrogant, and we are, some of us, quite often. But that's not all we are, and we're not the only ones doing that. And it's not always wrong. Ridiculous ideas are deserving of ridicule by definition, or they wouldn't be called ridiculous. People probably aren't most of the time. It's probably somebody's made a mistake. If your reason for engaging is just to show off, you're not helping. Number three, try to see nuance. I have a friend of mine who's writing a book about the death of nuance. Uh, because not just the secular community, but perhaps all communities worldwide seem to be losing sight of any hope of nuance in discussions. It's let me draw my lines, let me draw them firm. You are on this side of the line and therefore you are my best friend until I find another line that I can draw to exclude you, in which case you will join the enemy over there. <laughs> the world's not quite that simple. I'm not going to go off into a separate topic, but I have a friend who, who, who voted for a very specific reason in a way uh, that I was opposed to. Uh, he voted for Trump. <laughs> and his reason kind of blew my mind. It had nothing to do with being supportive of Trump or in opposition to Hillary. But when he tried to engage in honest conversations, the people he was talking to assumed that he was just trolling. There were things that he was trying to understand because perhaps his newsfeed had been filled with stuff that your newsfeed wasn't filled with. Perhaps he didn't have access to the same information that you had. And when he asked questions, he was dismissed as a troll and a racist. And what did that do to his perception of the people who were supporting Hillary or Bernie? Well, they're clearly irrational. I'm not those things. That, those labels don't fit me. They haven't even tried to offer me any sort of explanation. And based on the information in my newsfeed, they're a bunch of just irrational, far left, blah, blah, blahs trying to do this. So I'm going to vote this way. It's not all about Facebook and newsfeed. How we engage on stuff, and I made plenty of mistakes as well. I was one of the people who probably drove him to vote that direction. Pretty pissed about it, but he's in Kentucky, so one vote probably doesn't you know, make that much difference. <laughs> Number four, ask questions and address what people actually tell you is their answer and not what you think. There's an idea called mirroring where you can basically say, what I hear you saying is this. And you keep going and until you can actually state that to them so that they say, yes, that's what I'm saying, you probably shouldn't address what you thought they were saying. You may be stuck. You may sit there for an hour about going, no, that's not what I said. No, that's not what I meant. No, that's not what I said. No, that's not what I meant. But eventually, you'll either get there or it'll be you know, like a lunch break time, put a pen in it, go off and do something else and come back. But if you can't do that, if you can't say, this is what I understand you to be saying and get agreement from them, almost anything you say is likely to be wasted because they're already beginning, 10 minutes, thanks. They're already beginning with this idea that, oh, he's not even addressing what I said. She's not even talking about what my, what my position was. You're straw manning them and you don't even know it. It doesn't matter if you're fundamentally right in what you say or if it turns out you're correct in what they mean if they haven't acknowledged it because they've compartmentalized it in another bucket. Don't, don't, don't make assumptions and start talking to a Catholic or, or don't start talking to a Baptist about Catholic doctrine. If you don't know the difference, Catholics are the ones that buy into transubstantiation Baptists don't, and if you mock a Baptist for thinking that the cracker turns into the body of Jesus, they're going to know you don't have the first clue what you're talking about. Ha! <laughs> Look at this dumbass atheist. <laughs> Thinks I think the cracker turns into Jesus? Of course not. Not in any real sense. I mean, you know, it's just ceremonial that I'm engaging in a little cannibalism in a ceremonial <laughs> sense, but not in a real sense. <laughs> don't fall in love with an argument merely because it supports your position. Examine the arguments for your position even more robustly than you examine the arguments against it. I hate bad arguments. I want our side to be free of bad arguments, and I want the opposition to be loaded with them. This is not easy, but it is not all that difficult. If you, Socrates had said the, the unexamined life is not worth living, I think he was wrong. 
but I think there's a lot of value in examining your life. And I think few people actually do it, take stock of what they believe and why. And do you have good reasons? Or are you just, you know, were you, were you for this position before? And even though you changed everything else around it, did you maintain it without good reason? Number six is set an example whenever you can. Create a situation where they are obviously horrible if they attempt to disparage you. Don't give them the rope that they might need to hang you. If you have a brilliant argument, but you punctuate it with some hyperbolic point that isn't actually true, if you lie with statistics to misrepresent certain things, or you don't have the facts to back it up, they will latch onto that one point, ignore all of the good argumentative substance of what you're saying, and just go on and on about this one thing. You have sabotaged yourself. We need out rational, humanist atheists changing the world around the minds that won't be changed. There are plenty of people who will change their mind. There's plenty of people who do it from listening to the show. There are people who will do it from listening to debates. There were people who do it on their own because they found something frustrating. They didn't get the right answer from their pastor. They will find a way and they will change their mind. And there are people who don't, it doesn't seem like they will change their mind, but that's because you're not the one to help them with it. The first time you hear an idea, it's just weird. The second time you hear it, it's, hey, I've heard that before. And the third time you hear it, it's, wait a minute, there's a pattern here. Going back to the three on a match is bad luck thing from wartime. It's good luck. It's the way we recognize patterns. One, two, three, pattern. One, wow. Two, hmm. Three, ah. <laughs> But there are people whose minds aren't going to be changed. They're going to go to their grave. There are people that, unfortunately, we have to wait for them to die off. And in the meantime, you change the world around them to make their bad ideas less impactful. Now, I can rant with the best of them, but I'm far more careful to ensure that my rants do not include hyperbole and overreaching because it becomes an obvious weakness that allows the opposition to ignore the good content whenever you're right. And if you're right, you don't need it. I think it's possible and wise to make our case strong, compassionate, and my new favorite word, unimpeachable. <laughs> we have the higher ground and we should act like it. And acting like it can also include ridicule of ideas, not people, usually. And you can have heated, passionate, passionate discussions that are wholly, with a W, honest and accurate. We live in potentially terrifying times, but it's an opportunity. Because when everything is said and done, if we haven't destroyed ourselves, it'll be the skeptics and the humanists who will be recognized as pulling society up to the high ground while being beset on all sides by bad ideas, hatred, intolerance, fear, science denial, we may not be able to change every mind, but we can and do change minds every single day. And we will keep changing minds until we fix this or die trying. Thanks. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.